Welcome uh, to another installment of uh, Frankly Speaking. I'm glad uh, you've joined us today. And uh, today we're going to be in the book of Daniel. And I would encourage you, if you have your Bibles handy, uh, to get them out. And you might want to get some uh, note paper or whatever just to take notes. Um, this is, uh, most of us have heard the, the saying, we've seen the handwriting on the wall. Well, this is where that saying comes from. get into it, uh, Dan Daniel chapter 5, uh, let's, let's pray. Father in heaven, uh, Lord, we uh, pray that as we open your word, as we uh, study about the, uh, the handwriting on the wall in the book of Daniel, Lord, we pray that you would give us understanding, that your spirit would guide us, and that we would uh, learn valuable lessons of uh, how merciful you are, Lord, and um, that you know the beginning from the end, and we can have confidence that uh, you are the supreme God, the almighty God, that there is none other but you, and that uh, we can have faith and trust in you. Lord, we pray now that you guide us as uh, we uh, begin this study. These things we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. The book of uh, Daniel, chapter 5. It's a story of uh, Belteshazzar, I'm sorry, uh, Belshazzar, which was the, in the Bible it refers to him, uh, Nebuchadnezzar was his father, it says, but in the, in the Middle East, what they referred to as your ancestors like that, everybody was the father. So technically it was, uh, Belshazzar was the grandson of Nebuchadnezzar. So that hopefully that'll help you a little bit with the chronology um, as we read here that it won't become confusing to you because sometimes you know, if you're not familiar with the way things are done in, in, in ancient times, it, it, it could lead to some confusion. So that's the only reason I mention that. Chapter 5, verse 1. Belshazzar the king made a great feast to thousands of to a thousand of his lords, and drank wine before the thousand. <clears throat> Belshazzar, while he tasted the wine, commanded to bring the golden and silver vessels which his father, Nebuchadnezzar, had taken out of the temple, which was Jerusalem, that the king and his princes and his wives and concubines might drink therein. Now, this area that they're talking about here, if you go back to Daniel chapter 1, verse 2, you will see where it makes note of that, that uh, when they sacked uh, Jerusalem, that one of some of the things they took was the vessels from the house of God and the treasures of the house of, of God. So now we go several hundred years in, in or a couple hundred years into the future now, and we see uh, these vessels now are, are residing in uh, uh, Babylon. And Belteshazzar is throwing a big feast for his uh, uh, princes and all his, his uh, people. And generally... What they're doing, they're, they're worshiping their gods. Uh, alcohol and, and feasting was often part of that, and you even see that today in some religious uh, followings, that the feasts are very important. All right, um, in verse 3 it says, And they brought the golden vessels that were taken out of the temple of the house of God, which was in Jerusalem, and the king and the princes and his wives and his concubines drank in them. They drank wine and praised the gods of gold, silver, brass, of iron, and of wood and of stone. 
<clears throat> so what you see here, it's just like you see in, in many uh, heathen uh, beliefs, and you might even see it today under another name, but people are worshiping the creation rather than the creator. And that's about as plain as I could say it right now. Because uh, we understand that uh, there are forces that like to uh, censor things. So we have to, you know, hopefully you can read between the lines of what I'm saying. So they were worshiping these, these heathen gods in their mind. Now something interesting. Now can you imagine, just a, you saw on the news just too long, not too long ago, that uh, there was a big celebration for a football team that had just won a, a big game and that there was a shooting that went on and it just caused havoc. It turned a celebration into uh, everybody running in fear. Well, a similar circumstance happens here, Other, but it, this time it's not gunshots. This time it's a hand writing something on a wall. And we're going to read about what the Bible says about this event. And this is where, you see, uh, we saw the handwriting on the wall. This is where that saying comes from. In that same hour <coughs> came forth uh, fingers of a man's hand and wrote over against the candlesticks upon the plaster of the wall of the king's palace. And the king saw the part of the hand that wrote. Then the king's countenance was changed, and his thoughts troubled him, and so that his joints of his loins were loosened, and his knees smote one against another. I want to stop here just for a minute. A lot of people don't realize that little phrase right there is a prophetic utterance. If you turn with me now to Isaiah 45... Isaiah 45, verses 1 through 3. You're going to see that God prophesied these things 150 years before they occurred through the prophet Isaiah. Thus saith the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have holden to subdue nations before him. And I will loose the loings of the king. Did you, did you catch that? I will loose the loings of the king to open before him the two-leaved gates. The gates shall not be shut. And I will go before thee and make a crooked place straight. And I will break pieces of the gate of brass and cut it asunder and the bars of iron. And I will give unto thee the treasures of darkness and the hidden riches of the secret places, that thou mayest know that I am the Lord, which shall call thee by name. I am God of Israel. That's uh, pretty interesting. What's, what's about to happen here, and uh, the reason I want to pause here, if you notice in verse 6 again, it says that the king was was troubled by when what he had just seen, this, this bloodless hand writing on the plaster right in the middle of his party. You know, there's, you can imagine, I use your imagination, <coughs> that you, you know, that there's revelry going on, laughing and all kind of craziness going on. And then all of a sudden, there's like a hush falls as they look at the king's face and the king's face is growing pale. And his knees are banging together as he's witnessing something amazing. That it says that his joints of his loins were loosed and his knees smote one against another. Think about the, the accuracy of this prophecy that we just read in, in Isaiah. It's talking about this. And King Cyrus, remember we go back to the prophecy of of uh, King Nebuchadnezzar when he had uh, the vision about that he couldn't remember that it was this metal thing with the golden head and the the, the breast and, and chest of silver 
and the, the, the hips of, of bronze, and then the legs of iron and then the feet of iron and clay. Remember that back in Daniel chapter 2? What, what is happening here is now this prophecy is, is about to be fulfilled where the head of gold now is to fall to this next kingdom, the Medes and the Persians. Cyrus was the general for the Medes and the Persians. And he was named by name by God in Isaiah 45, 150 years before he was even born. This is the remarkable. And then to talk about the golden uh, gates or the bronze gates, the river Euphrates ran through Babylon and basically they had uh, huge brass gates that, that protected that from invasion. The walls on Babylon were, they could ride, I think, like three or four chariots abreast on the top of the wall. So this was an imposing structure, and it was well fortified. <clears throat> it's interesting also that, um, as we'll read on later here, that uh, as Daniel gives the interpretation that he's going to, to make some revelations that will relate back to this. So continuing on with the story now in verse 7, Daniel 5, verse 7. And the king, king cried aloud to bring the astrologers and the Chaldeans and the soothsayers. And the king spake and said to the wise men of Babylon, Whosoever shall read the writing and show me the interpretation thereof shall be clothed with scarlet and have a chain of gold put around his neck and shall be the third ruler in the kingdom. Now think about that for a minute. That's quite a quite a reward, isn't it? I mean, so it's obvious that uh, uh, Belshazzar was very worried about it. He realized that something, this, this you've not seen something like this in your life, I'm sure. All of a sudden a hand starts scribing words on, on a wall, that would be kind of scary. It would, it would kind of get your attention, wouldn't it? So the king realizes that this is a supernatural event, and he knows that uh, something very important is taking place here, and he doesn't understand it. So he calls all these uh, astrologers and stuff, <clears throat> and just like with the, uh, the Daniel 2 vision with the metal statue that uh, Nebuchadnezzar uh, dreamed about. None of the astrologers could give interpretation of it. And we find a similar situation here that uh, they, they don't know what to make of this. They can't read the language. It, it is shocking even to them. And um, verse 9 then the king, Belshazzar, greatly troubled, and his countenance was changed in him, and his lords, lords were astonished or confounded. In other words, they were just like, oh my, what does this mean? You know, that uh, here is the greatest nation in the, in the face of the earth, and something like this happened. This, this omen does not seem like a good thing. And they are deeply troubled. And when they look at the face of the king and they see the way that he is responding and his legs are beating together. Have you ever been that scared where your legs shake? shake? Maybe after a car accident or something like that. Have you ever been where you, your body is shaking from the adrenaline? This is what the king, this, this was like real fear. This wasn't just like, oh, what was that? No, this was... This was Fear, deep fear. Now the queen, by reason of the words of the king and his lords, came unto the banquet house. And the queen spake and said, O king, live forever. Let not thy thoughts be troubled, nor let thy countenance be changed. There is a man in thy kingdom in whom is the spirit of the holy gods. And in the days of thy father, light 
and understanding and wisdom like that of the wisdom of the gods was found in him, whom the king of King Nebuchadnezzar, thy father, the king, I say thy father made master of the magicians and astrologers, Chaldeans and soothsayers, for inasmuch as as an excellent spirit and knowledge and understanding interpreting of dreams and showing of hard sentences and dissolving of doubts were found in the same Daniel, whom king named Belshazzar, let now Daniel be called and he will show us the interpretation. Now think about this for a minute. <clears throat> we, uh, the, the, the younger generation, most of them don't, don't remember the assassination of Kennedy. They don't remember the explosion of the Challenger uh, uh, rocket ship. They don't even know where Vietnam is on a map. And the, the Vietnam War, it, it, it affected my generation. So see, you see, generations pass by and we forget our history. And I think we can see that today, even in our own culture today, that there is a, a process going by trying to erase or to forget history. History is important for us to understand because history can be a teacher. There's uh, people that have said that if you don't know history, you're condemned to repeat it. And so the Bible is given to us. The historical events are given to us for, the Bible says, for those that live in the time of the end so that we can understand from the lessons that were shown in, in the Old Testament, they will come we will be able to, to make understanding of what is taking place today. We can see that there is a similar thing. King Solomon said there's nothing new under the sun. And so we can see that God has a way of doing this. God never changes. So we begin to see the fingerprints of God on things, and we can understand that God is moving. And uh, this this is what, what's interesting here. The, the queen, which was the, the daughter of Nebuchadnezzar, she remembered because her generation had seen and heard all these stories about Daniel and, and her, her father. And uh, so she was reminding the king now, Belshazzar, you know, you need to inquire this Daniel. He's, he's uh, a, an administrator within your kingdom, and he helped your grandfather out, and I'm sure that he can give you clarity in, in what this means. And so we read on here that um, verse 12, for as much as, uh, I'm sorry, uh, verse 13, then, the, then was Daniel brought before the king, and the king spake and said unto Daniel, Art thou Daniel, which art the children of captivity of, Jerusalem, of uh, Judah? whom the king, my father, brought out of jewelry. I have even heard of thee, but the spirit of the gods is in thee, and the light of understanding and excellent wisdom is found in thee. Now, let's, let's look at a couple Bible texts real quick. Uh, Psalms uh, 119, verse 105. Psalms 119, 105. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. When we are going through places where we're unsure, God's word will shine a light on our path and help us to understand what needs to be done. Too often, we rely on politicians and other people who supposedly are smart, but there's none smarter than the God of heaven. And so I, I would recommend to you that make the Bible a constant uh, companion of yours if you want to understand what's going on in difficult times because I believe it will ease some of your 
uh, fears and you will understand that the God of heaven is in charge. And uh, let's uh, continue on now. Uh, verse 15. And now the wise men, the astrologers, have been brought in before me, and they should read the writing and should make known unto me the interpretation thereof. But they could not show the interpretation of the thing, just like in Daniel 2 with the metal statue, remember? And if you don't, go back and read that again, and you'll see that there's a, a repeating taking place here, that there's only one who knows the future, and that is God himself. Just like he predicted that Cyrus was going to overthrow the kingdom of Babylon, as is about to happen here shortly, God knows the beginning from the end. So if you're worried about the future, I would recommend to you the Bible, that the Bible will help you to understand what is to come and that you can have confidence in the God of heaven. Then he heard, verse 16, And I have heard of thee, and thou canst make interpretations and dissolve doubts. Now if thou canst read the writing and make known to me the interpretation thereof, Thou shalt be clothed in scarlet, and have a chain of gold put about thy neck, and thou shalt be the third ruler in the kingdom. Then Daniel answered and said before the king, Let thy gifts be to thyself, and give thy reward to another. Yet I will read the writing unto the king, and make known unto him the interpretation. O thou great king, the most high God gave Nebuchadnezzar thy father a kingdom and a majesty and glory and honor. Now I want to pause here just for a minute. If you go back and you look at the previous things, remember we talked about the great tree being cut down? And Nebuchadnezzar, as he was looking on his great kingdom, he said, look at a great kingdom I have made. And remember that uh, God had sent this dream to him to warn him that it is God who brings his blessings, is not from the hand of Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar's pride had gotten the best of him, and God was sending him a warning. And there was time that uh, Nebuchadnezzar, God waited a full 12 months after that vision before he uh, brought it to pass, hoping that Nebuchadnezzar would take heed and repent of his ways. But just like the Pharaoh of Egypt, you know, he rebelled against God. And uh, God brought this punishment on him that said seven times to come over him and he will become like a wild beast, eating grass and, and living like an animal for seven years. And if you add that time, you will find out that that comes up to 2,520 days, which was uh, three times, which is... A year in the Bible was 360 days. So if you multiply 7 times 360, it comes up to 2520. So that was how many days that Nebuchadnezzar, and then the Bible says that Nebuchadnezzar, his mind, he began to think, and he began to reason that he had made a mistake, and he cried out to God, and God restored his sense to him and put him back on the, crown, on the throne. And it was probably a year, there's some that say 17 years, some say a year after that before he passed away. And uh, so this, is, this might be a good place for us to pause before we get into the interpretation. And um, so what I would encourage you to do is to go ahead and read this again slowly. And uh, we'll pick up uh, with the next installment. So uh, let us close with a word of prayer. Father in heaven, help us to see the handwriting on the wall, that thou, O God, are the great God, the creator God, that there is none greater, none before thee, and that thou knowest the beginning from the end, and that you have written our names on the palms of your hand, and that you are well familiar with us, and that you love us. Lord, I pray as we uh, 
the next time that we get together that we will read Daniel's interpretation of the uh, vision of Belshazzar and we will see the great wisdom of Jehovah. Be with us now, Lord, bless us. Watch over our families. And uh, Lord, uh, we thank you for the word of God that uh, gives us guidance. These things we pray in the name of Jesus.